Lesson fifty four of the History of London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. The History of London by Walter Besant. Lesson fifty four Rogues and Vagabonds. The aspect of the city varies from age to age. The streets and the houses, the costumes, the language, the manners all change. In one respect, however, there is no change. We have always with us the same rogues and the same roguery. We do not treat them quite after the manner followed by our forefathers, and, as their methods were incapable of putting a stop to the tricks of those who live by trickery, so are ours. Therefore we must not pride ourselves on any superiority in this direction. A large and very interesting collection of books might be formed on the subject of rogues and vagabonds. The collection would begin with Elizabeth, and could be carried on to the present day, new editions being made from year to year. But very few editions are ever made to the customs and the methods of the profession. For instance, there is the confidence trick, in which the rustic is beguiled by the honest stranger into trusting him. This trick was practised three hundred years ago. Or there is the ring-dropping trick, it is as old as the hills. Or there is the sham sailor, now very rarely met with. When we have another war he will come to the front again. We have still the cheating gambler, but he has always been with us. In King Charles the Second's time he was called a ruffler, a huff, or a shabaroon. The woman who now begs along the streets, singing a hymn and leading borrowed children, did the same thing two hundred years ago, and was called a clapper-dozen. The man who pretends to be deaf and dumb went about then, and was known as the dummerer. The burglar was then the housebreaker. Burglary was formerly a far worse crime than it is now, because the people for the most part kept all their money in their houses, and a robbery might ruin them. The pickpocket plied his trade, only he was then a cut-purse. The footpad lay in wait on the lonely country road, or among the bushes of the open fields at the back of Lincoln's Inn. The punishments, which seemed so mild under the Plantagenets, increased in severity as the population outgrew the powers of the government. Instead of plain standing in pillory, ears were nailed to the post and even sliced off. Whippings became more commonly administered, and were much more severe. Heretics were burned by Elizabeth, as well as by Mary, though not so often. After the civil wars we enter upon a period when punishment became savage in its cruelty, of which you will presently learn more. Meantime, remark that when the city was less densely populated, and when none lived outside the wards and walls, the people were well under the control of the aldermen and their officers. They were also well known to each other. They exercised that self-government, the best of any, which consists in refusing to harbour a rogue among them. If in every London street the tenants would refuse to suffer any evildoer to lodge in their midst, the police of London might be almost abolished. But the city grew, the wards became densely populated, then houses and extensive suburbs sprang up at Whitechapel, Wapping, outside Cripplegate, at Smithfield, north of Fleet Street, Lambeth, Bermondsey and Rotherhithe. The aldermen no longer knew their people. The men of a ward did not know each other. Rogues were harboured about Smithfield and outside Aldgate. The simple machinery for enforcing order ceased to be of any use, and as yet the new police was not invented. Therefore the punishments became savage. Since the government could not prevent crime and compel order, they would deter. Apart from active crime, vagrancy was a great scourge. Wars and civil wars left crowds of idle soldiers who had no taste for steady work. They became vagrants. There was also, and there is still, 
a certain proportion of men and women who will not work. They become vagrants by a kind of instinct. They are born vagabonds. Laws and proclamations were continually passed for the repression of vagrants. They were passed on to their native place. They were provided with passes on their way. But these laws were always being evaded, and vagrants increased in number. Under Henry the Eighth, a very stringent statute was passed, by which old and impotent persons were provided with licence to beg, and anybody begging without a licence was whipped. But, like all such acts, it was imperfectly carried out. For one who received a whipping, a dozen escaped. Stocks, pillory, bread and water, all were applied, but without visible effect, because so many escaped. London especially swarmed with beggars and pretended cripples. They lived about Turnmill Street, Houndstitch and the Barbican, outside the walls. From time to time a raid was carried on against them, and they dispersed, but only to collect again. In the year 1575, for instance, it is reported that there were few or no rogues in the London prisons. But in the year 1581, the Queen, observing a large number of sturdy rogues during a drive, made complaint, with the result that the next day seventy-four were arrested, the day after sixty, and so on, the catch on one day being a hundred, all of whom were soundly paid, i.e. flogged and sent to their own homes. The statute ordering the whipping of vagabonds was enforced even in this present century, women being flogged as well as men. No statutes, however, can put down the curse of vagrancy and idleness. It can only be suppressed by the will and resolution of the people themselves. If, for a single fortnight, we should all refuse to give a single penny to beggars, if, in every street, we should all resolve upon having none but honest folk among us, then, and only then, would the rogue find this island of Great Britain impossible to be longer inhabited by him and his tribe? End of Lesson 54 Recording by Ruth Golding